Ecora Resources may be new to you. It certainly was to me. It's come about as a rebranding of Anglo-Pacific Group. It's listed in London and Toronto and has activities in Australia, uh, North and South America and Europe. And that's where its main activities are around the world. The chief executive is Mark Bishop Lafleche, who's been with the business eight years, but was uh, given the job of chief executive earlier on in 2022. And he's with us now on the line. Mark, welcome. It's a pleasure to be able to catch up with you. Um, before we get into the full nature of the business and, and what's been brought over from Anglo Pacific Group into this rebranded Ecora Resources, explain why the rebranding. Hmm. It was a great place to start, Jeremy. So thank you for having me here today. So why the rebranding? Well, fundamentally, the rebranding is a is really the end point of what has been a core strategic objective over the last eight years. And that has been to reposition this business and to reposition our portfolio away from its legacy and heritage and, and steelmaking coal and towards the future, where we have, by 2026, we expect to have materially no coking coal exposure or steelmaking coal and provide investors with exposure to a basket of commodities that are absolutely integral to the energy transition. So by that, we mean, number one, four key trends. Uh, and number the first of those trends is really the production of commodities required for the production of renewable energy. The second is the transmission of that electricity. The third is you know, the consumption in the form of electric vehicles or batteries. Um, and the fourth key trend really is just mining in a greener way, greener projects, less of an environmental impact. So having achieved a major pivot and transformation in our asset base, we felt it was time to rebrand the business to reflect that change. So just to confirm, this is a business which is built on the idea of royalties, isn't it? And I think that, that remains, doesn't it? That, that is still the core um, way about your delivering value to shareholders. Explain what a royalty is and how it benefits a shareholder um, in the current environment especially. Yeah, the, the royalty model is one that's very proven, albeit our, our story as Ecore is very unique in that we are probably the largest and most diversified royalty business focusing on future-facing commodities as opposed to precious metals. Why are royalties interesting? Well, at its simplest form, when we acquire a royalty, we make a payment, and in exchange, we are entitled to receive a portion of any of the revenue that's generated uh, from the extraction of minerals from that property into the future. So what that means is we are not required to put capital costs in for the mining project. We're not required to contribute towards sustaining capital costs. We're not exposed to operating cost inflation. We are effectively um, an annuity um, for any minerals extracted in relation to that uh, underlying area. So this is a very defensive way of getting exposure to the mining sector. Um, it doesn't have the same upside or downside volatility, but for many folks, that volatility in itself is something that is unattractive. Yeah, so it gives you an insulation then, doesn't it, from inflationary costs, but you benefit thereafter from higher prices. It sounds a bit like a win-win. Um, I, I, I guess there is a downside to it. I can't immediately identify what it is, but what do you have to do as a business to hedge against any headwinds that might develop in the royalty business model? Well, the royalty model in its simplest form is actually a, a, a really shines through in, in an inflationary environment because commodities, as we all know, tend to price upwards. Um, but a mining company will see its operating costs equally um, adjust such that the operating margin of the, margin of the mining company may remain constant. As a royalty company, you know, those dollars flow through to us. As, as again, to repeat, forgive me, but our revenue is calculated with reference to uh, the revenue generated from, from products as opposed to the revenue minus costs. In terms of headwinds for our business, it really comes down to being able to grow because these are depleting assets. So we constantly are in the business of acquiring new royalties and streams to not only replace the assets as they're diminished, but also to incrementally add growth and diversification to our business. Yeah. Talk to us a little bit about um, the way the business is structured and where your big revenues are coming in from at the moment. Yeah, the business today it reflects what have been incredibly strong prices in steel making, uh, steel making coal, excuse me. Now that's 
our exposure to steel making coal, as I mentioned earlier, will, will run to zero naturally. We've made a conscious decision to exit all our coal exposure, so we're running that off. And we have a portfolio of assets excluding the steel making coal in copper, nickel, and cobalt. Um, and that is expected to ramp up to up in the range of $100 million in the medium term. Uh, that's very much subject to development of some assets in our portfolio, which is why we always seek to target really strong counterparties. Uh, one of our counterparties, actually, Oz Minerals, has been subject to speculation of a, of a takeover bid from BHP, which was made public a few months ago. So when you look at our, at our assets, one of the key risks in the royalty model is where are these assets located on the cost curve? And by that, I mean, are they low cost and they're able to operate profitably through cycle? Um, because commodity prices go up, but they also go down through cy economic cycles. Uh, and number two, counterparties. Do you have strong counterparties who can run the mines effectively? Uh, we believe that our assets are, are really, really attractive on, on, both, uh, on both metrics for the most part. You, you talk about this uh, deal with BHP. You were alluding to the $185 million uh, acquisition of South 32's royalty business, which, of course, was all spun out of BHP uh, originally. That sounds an interesting deal. Uh, talk to me more about that and, and why the deal was done and, and what is the longevity of the, of the business you bought? That, that transaction is... One of the latest steps amongst many others in terms of our transformation and our, our, our pivot away from um, steel making coal. Uh, we acquired that portfolio earlier from South 32, um, who viewed this portfolio as non-core, given they are a mining company, a uh, diversified global mining company. In fact, most research analysts are not even aware that these, these royalty assets existed within South 32. So it was a great way for South 32 to unlock value. Similarly for Ecora, we're able to acquire uh, a portfolio of royalties of which two are really key. The first is a royalty over the West Musgraves project, which is owned um, by Oz Minerals in Australia, a fantastic mid-cap counterparty who have a uh, demonstrated track record of building projects and you know, have recently been subject to speculation and an approach from, from BHP, one of the largest and most diversified mining companies in the world. So that's a great validation of that investment. Uh, we also have exposure to, as a, as a result of that portfolio acquisition, the Santo Domingo project. Um, and within the last week, uh, Capstone Copper, the owner of that project, released a synergy study between the Santo Domingo project and the nearby Manto Verde project, in supporting a, a whole district potential. So these two royalties are really key to our growth profile and are really expected to come online sort of mid to late decade um, and, and really be instrumental in that path to having a potential $100 million of income, all from very green commodities. I'm interested as well in seeing that South 32 has retained, I think, what is now 16.9% interest in Ecora. Is that correct? And that sounds like a, a big lump to give to one interested party. What is their long term interest, do you think, in? in eCora. Um, are they just happy to be a shareholder sitting on for the ride and the money in the longer term? Or do you think there's something deeper and more meaningful, perhaps, maybe uh, for this, um, this slice of the pie that you've got uh, on the shareholder investment base? Well, first of all, South Australia, too, have been fantastic shareholders. Uh, they're a great counterparty. They're a great group. And we couldn't be happier to have them at 17% on our register. Um, South 32 owns, uh, they've said publicly, a uh, portfolio of royalties in, in, other than what we've already acquired that, that exceeds 30 assets. So theoretically, in the future, I, I would, we would certainly hope it, that uh, there's potential to do more with South 32, uh, that we would certainly be the logical counterparty given that stake they have in this company. Um, longer term, I, I would feel that they look at our business and they've commented on this publicly. In, in a really favorable light, given our exposure to a commodity basket of future-facing commodities uh, entirely overlaps with the South 32's stated strategy, which is to build a portfolio of assets in copper, nickel, coal, and so, uh, cobalt, and so forth. Uh, really just a basket of commodities that are required for the energy transition. So by retaining a 17% stake in these assets as a result of that transaction, South 32, and they've said so publicly, are able to retain a lot of the upside exposure that exists in these assets 
Um, but not only that, also within our wider portfolio. It's, in, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, as I said, that they obviously see something in the business which is very appealing. I want to show you a share price chart um, for Ecora Resources. Now, when showing this, it has to be qualified, of course, doesn't this? This chart goes back to 2015. And of course, the vast majority of this was when the company was called Anglo Pacific Group, but now called Ecora Resources. As chief executive, and I look, I speak to so many CEOs about this. You're not unique in as much as you must be frustrated at the way in which the shares are performing. Market cap of 400 million. You're talking a lot about some really big projects here with potentially some really big income. Um, again, how frustrating is it for you as CEO seeing shares in this position? Where should they be, bearing in mind the projects you're undertaking and the expectations for future earnings on the royalty agreements you've got? Well, relative to other royalty companies, I would have, we definitely trade at a discount to our peers in North America. Um, but I think recently the group has traded, and, and, not, and we're not alone in this in the United Kingdom, M many companies are trading as from top-down micro macro factors that are really driving the share price performance. Um, there's a really different picture if you look at e-core resources from a bottom up and that our core assets are generating you know, substantial cash flows and the commodity prices linked to our core assets that are in production today have remained fairly robust. And looking into the future, the supply demand balances for commodity uh, uh, baskets are, are really strong and favorable. Um, so it does appear that in, the in times of market dislocation, um, Sort of the bottom up factors can be sort of lost in the uh, lost in the ether, so to speak. So to speak, but that that's that is kind of what it is. The good news is we're really confident on the business that we've built, and you know, thankfully, these types of uh, market inefficiencies never really seem to last forever. Yeah, well, let's let's hope. Um, look, let's let's round this up and, and ask you to bring it all together and talk to you a little bit about uh, what's in your entry, uh, what are you looking at at the moment, what sort of uh, deals are you doing. Uh, which is going to build shareholder value in the business. Because let's face it, that's what it's all about. The investors wanting a, a slice of the pie, as I said, that South 32 was clearly uh, interested in, in taking a, 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 an opportunity on. Um, how do you see things developing? What, as I say, is in your intro, and what have you got in terms of some of the news you're expecting to publish over the next six or nine months or so? Yeah, well, the organic is in our portfolio. We've already seen some fantastic news in relation to the West Musgraves royalty, where Oz Minerals has started construction of, the, of that project and are, are targeting first production in 2025. So that is a fantastic validation of our investment case at the time of the transaction with South 32 earlier in July. We're also expecting more news in relation to Santo Domingo over the next 12 months. And one of our key growth projects is a Brazilian nickel cobalt project called the POE project owned by Brazilian Nickel. Uh, that group is currently out seeking funding where we are hoping to deploy another $70 million to acquire a royalty over what appears to be a tier one nickel cobalt project, producing a nickel product which could flow directly into battery precursor supply chains. So there's a lot in our portfolio that's expected to come in the next 12 to 24 months. Um, beyond that, as always, we're looking to grow. And, you know, we, we always look at periods of, as a permanent source of capital to the mining sector, periods of market dislocation for us are a great time to deploy capital. Um, so we're, we're, we're hopeful that the next 12 to 24 months will also present uh, attractive royalty opportunities for us to continue to grow the royalty portfolio. Well, look, Mark, we'll, we'll leave it there. But thanks indeed uh, for joining us with an update on what is going on at Ecora Resources, the company having been rebranded from Anglo Pacific Group. It's a pleasure to be able to catch up with you. That's uh, Mark uh, Bishop Lafleche, who's the chief executive of Ecora Resources.